to episode three of The Piper in the Cave. Uh, first, let me acknowledge that this has been recorded on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to acknowledge their elders past, present and future and acknowledge that sovereignty over this land was never ceded. So if um, that may have signified this to you, but if not, I am back in Melbourne. Um, this is not actually my house, but it's a perfectly nice place to record a quick episode while I'm here. It's getting dark, um, but we'll see if we can get this in. Okay, so I'm playing this tune today, The Piper in the Cave, our, you know, our title tune for this little project. And um, I haven't been playing this tune that long, honestly. And I want to give credit to the amazing local fiddler Shane Lester Doe for... Um, for introducing me to this tune. I have a recording of her playing it uh, from the session bar at the National Folk Festival, I guess about three or four months ago now, and um, had never heard it before. Um, but that was one of my sources in learning this tune. And um, as well as a few others, um, it, it's very much a Donegal fiddle tune. So um, people trace this back to John Doherty. Uh, I haven't actually been able to find a recording of John playing it, but a lot of other musicians, um, especially fiddle players, um, and especially you know in that Donegal sort of um, milieu, I guess, have um, have played this tune. Um, Paul O'Shaughnessy has a really nice version. He actually has three parts, whereas everyone else I've heard has two. Again, I don't know. Uh, John Doherty played it with or three. Um, I, I, and I considered recording it with three parts as well. I tried both ways, but in the end I went with the two. Uh, but also Alton have recorded it. Um, Francie Byrne, another Donegal fiddler, has a recording which is called just the Bagpipe March, but clearly the same tune. And uh, Martin Tourish has a recording on the accordion as well. Um, so those are my main main sources in learning this. I would love to hear John Doherty's version if anyone does happen to have it lying around, if it's even been recorded. But I think I think I saw on the um, ITMA, Irish Traditional Music Archive site, that there is something on a reel-to-reel -reel tape floating around somewhere. Okay. Uh, I guess part of the reason I wanted to play this is, well, because I like the name, and there's also a story to go with it. Um, again, I'm just acquiring this second hand off the internet, so, um, yeah, if I could find a recording of John Doherty or someone else telling the story, that would be great. But a similar story is also atta attached to another great tune, uh, The Further the Deeper. And, um, in this story there's this deep, dark cave in Donegal, and, uh, no one has ever found out how deep it goes because everyone who has tried to explore it has never returned. But this local piper fancies his chances, and um, he wanders in with his dog following him, playing this tune on the pipes, presumably um, war pipes or something, unless he was particularly coordinated to be able to play one of these while he was walking along. But anyhow, um, and the, the locals can hear his piping just getting fainter and fainter and fainter playing this same tune and he's never heard of again um, but his dog makes it out alive em emerges a few days later but without its skin um, so yeah there's there's some sinister um, aspects to this tune that I, I guess I try and bring out too and um, another reason I like to play it is because to me, there is something about this tune that is just fundamentally pipey. Um, and I think it's really to do with the scale that we're playing in, which is um, an octave. And then this low note. Um, which is such a characteristic of the, the basic scale of so many bagpipes. Though not the Elam pipes, you know, we, we lost that flat seventh, that low note below the D be C, um, which means that much as I would love to play it in like maybe its most natural home would be that, that would be uh, that would be 
great, but then we get to and we have to jump up to the to get a C natural, which is not the most musical thing. So I ended up playing it in G. I'll talk a bit about that uh, later, why I chose that. In fact, that'll be one of my main topics. But I just want to say that if you do play like a, a classic nine note bagpipe, um, Highland pipes, Scottish small pipes, Border pipes, and so on, uh, plenty of others too, of course, um, then I think this will be really interesting repertoire. The challenge you'll face is that it has both minor and major thirds in it. So um, in this case, it's got a the B, the B flat, and the B natural. Uh, but you know, if on your pipes, if you play one of those instruments and you do have some way of fudging even um, that flat third, it doesn't need to be like beautifully in tune or anything. It can be a bit nasty sounding um, and then can go to that beautiful open major third um, then yeah I think this will be a really fun repertoire but anyhow as I say on this instrument um, D is not an option but because we do have two octaves give or take we actually have plenty of other places we can kind of insert this tune so E would be a great choice <laughs> It's actually not a true minor, I guess. It's you'd say it's a Dorian tune because it has that natural sixth. So if you were to play it in uh, B minor, which you know is often another key we play, you play minor tunes in, you would have to use a lot of G sharp. So I probably wouldn't go there. But if you enjoy that key, by all means, um, that could be fun. Um, I think Paul Schaffner sees recording is B minor, in fact. Um, but I've chosen to play it in G. Oh yeah, sorry, I will say, um, playing it in E, you will also be using a bit of the G sharp key um, when you get into that second part. Uh, um, you will be playing that. Um, A has the advantage that you can play it all without using the keys because you have your A natural. What am I talking about? Your C natural and your C sharp, just accessible with um, different fingerings without the keys. So that's A is probably the most natural choice in many ways. But I like to play it in G. And there's a few reasons for that. I like playing tunes in G minor in general, honestly. One reason is because of the relationship with a lot of a lot of tunes in minor keys to our drones. So, you know, if you think of tunes in like E minor, uh, A minor and B minor, which are kind of where most, the keys we often, most often play, um, the minor keys we most often play, they're all against the D drone, which um, gives us a certain amount of tension, like, but to some extent uh, A minor too. That's a bit more homecoming, but not the, you know, deep satisfaction of playing which would be D minor. And also B minor. It's another candidate, I guess. quite tense. Um, A is probably the most natural sound, A minor, of those keys, other than the D minor, over this. Um, but yeah, um, just because of how the instrument works, 
We play a lot in G major and D major. Um, but, um, yeah, a lot of our minor keys, the ones that are easily accessible, do not have that really deep, satisfying return to that drone note or something closely related to it. But if I play in G minor, of course, that to me is just a really beautiful sound that is not explored in a great amount of piping, though it is, it is there. Um, there's plenty of people who do that, but so much of our repertoire avoids that kind of space for perfectly good reasons of what is nice under our fingers. Um, but I like to kind of go there sometimes too. And another reason I like to is that if I take the slide piece off this baritone drone, I have um, that drone will play a G. Suddenly, that G becomes just a really, really beautiful place to just sit and hear that resonance against the drones. Um, yeah, look, your drone may not do that, obviously. That's, you know, not a feature of the instrument. That's just something I kind of discovered in messing around. Um, Though it wasn't, it wasn't really a pure G when I got there, it was some distance off, but I actually kind of made it go the last way by just exactly where I seat that reed and how much ballast is on the tongue, uh, because I, I wanted it to do that. Um, it's obviously, if that then goes out of tune, then it's a much fiddlier enterprise to, um, to get it back in tune than to use that slide, so I wouldn't always count on it, but when it works, it's a lot of fun. Um, and you know, other pipes have got the got a G using the bass drone, like Mikey Smith's will um, famously perhaps overblow to a G much more easier, much more easily than it will play its actual note of D. And I've heard some other pipers get that over a bass drone too. So yeah, you know, I'm all for like messing around with this stuff. <laughs> and um, even if you don't come up with anything satisfying that you want to use in your music making, I think you've, you'll have come to understand your instrument a little deeper and that will actually come across. And um, on that note, I also really enjoy playing in that G minor key because I play my uh, B flats with a cross fingering, not with the key. Hardly ever touch the B flat key, honestly. What I do instead is play so lifting that middle finger off. And in fact, it's a bit like the C natural in that I'm, if I throw it all the way off, it will become quite sharp. Um, so often I'm kind of keeping it against the chanter and keeping a little bit of, tiny bit of shading over that hole. But because of that, I can um, actually kind of slide and did a lot of that in that tune, right? Um, so you have that opportunity for expression, like you get out of your C natural. Um, in a way that you would really struggle, I think, to get out of the key. And some other things, um, I guess, you know, with your B flat, you can. There are vibrato options, um, but I feel some really nice vibrato options there. And you can kind of combine that with the, the slide into it um, in really, um, I think, expressive ways that, you know, would probably maybe more of a challenge on the key. And the other thing that no one can do on the key is staccato. You can even do a B, C, B triplet with a B flat.
interesting options there, I think, that are probably going to pass you by to some extent if you use that key. And I just like the tone more, honestly. Um, for me, this is quite a shrill, quite a shrill note. Um, doesn't have a lot of that kind of beautiful complexity that we get out of a flat chanter. Whereas, um, to me, that's a note that just kind of sits better. in dialogue with the notes around it than does. There's such a difference in tone, say, between that B flat with a key and the C natural cross fingered. And I just, yeah, I just really like the sound of that one is I guess what I keep saying. Um, and again, I think a lot of flat chanters may get there. Um, so, you know, do give that a go. You may, I would be surprised if a concert pitch chanter had a really beautiful B natural lifting that note, um, but by all means try it. So lifting that just that middle finger, by all means try it. And remember that, you know, it doesn't have to be like, don't discard it because it's not in tune to begin with, because firstly, what the hell does that even mean? You know, there's so many colors available for all of these in piping in general for all of the notes we play and by picking the one that's most in tune whatever that means to you we discard a lot of really beautiful options and secondly remember like the lesson of the C natural you know you, you see a fingering chart and it looks like you just play that or you know whatever some other options are with the lower hand um, but we don't consider it a defect if that gives you something that's too sharp or otherwise out of tune, we just learn to manage it. Um, and learn to manage it and use that managing device, which is usually shading this top finger for expressive purposes, or equally choosing a different fingering on the, not that one, don't choose that one, on the bottom hand. Um, and you know, these are all just part of the colors available on our instrument. And if we find two that are close and um, both work, then we instantly have an option for vibrato, you know? Oh, well done. That or, or that or whatever, you know? Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd encourage you, this is probably what I'll end on even, I would, yeah, just encourage you to mess around. Find all the, all the beautiful sounds and all the shitty, nasty sounds you're probably never going to use on your chanter because every... Everything you explore, I think, will equip you better um, for playing music. And, you know, that's an ongoing ongoing process of discovery for me, of course, with this chanter and with other ones I play. Um, but yeah, you know, like, hell. What about that one? you got there um, doesn't mean you have to use these sounds but um, I'd, I'd just encourage you know exploring all the all the weirdness you can find um, because you know fundamentally it's all about getting as much expressive juice out of this machine as we can and yeah I just believe in that that will only come through like that kind of deep sonic exploration. All right, it's almost dark outside. I don't know if you can even still see me, but um, thank you for tuning in to episode three. I um, think you have a slow air for next time, maybe, and thank you. Um, please do get in touch if you have any questions, and otherwise I'll see you next time on The Piper in the Cave. <laughs>